heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Sequoia splits into three firms. The venture capital powerhouse divides into several entities. That's as geopolitical tensions. They're on the rise. We'll break down the announcement. And Coinbase is the latest target by the SEC, with the regulator suing the exchange. We'll discuss the U.S. crackdown on crypto ahead. Plus, we've got to dive into the state of virtual and augmented reality following Apple's Vision Pro release. We've got the CEO of AR company Magic Leap on the show. All that and so much more coming up. First, let's check in on relatively muted markets today. Regional banks getting a kick higher, but in general, we're looking at what the World Bank is warning about the global environment in which we stand. What of interest rates? What of the disruption to global economies? We're up five tenths of percent on the Nasdaq as big tech manages to push up, even though as Apple is a little lackluster. We see the two-year yield, though, on the higher side, five basis points on the front end. That means maybe we're less confident that the Federal Reserve will put on ice some of those rate, cut, rate hikes, even rate cut. Remember, Rich Clarida, he's the vice chair of the Fed today, saying, look, we're not cutting anytime soon and likely to see on pause for the time being. Euro, currently up by two tenths percent. Interesting that inflationary pressures just dialed back that little bit in the Eurozone. Meanwhile, Australian central bank fighting inflation hard. This really is the global narrative, inflation and how that affects global growth. But moving on because, well, one risk asset, one growth asset might say, actually having an interestingly volatile day. We're back to it with Bitcoin and actually trading higher, 26,000. It was still well below that 30,000 number that we managed to crack a little while ago. We were worried about some of the effects of the SEC focused on crypto, but actually managed to push higher about 10 a.m. there or thereabouts. So maybe people are buying the dip at the moment, Ed. Yeah, very clearly moving to the downside is Apple off by three tenths of a percent. The street basically saying this is either sell the news or details of the Vision Pro mixed reality headset already priced into the stock. We will have a lot of day two reaction and analysis from that big WWDC event. I'm looking at a lot of the chip sector as well. Taiwan Semiconductor, this is the U.S., ADRs up by 2%. They restated their full year CapEx guidance, coming at the low end of the previously guided range, around $32 billion. Having an impact in markets, applied materials, the chip equipment maker, higher by a percentage point, have been lower. The idea being less CapEx spend by the world's biggest contract chip manufacturer would not be good news, but actually a rebound there. And sticking with chips, Intel, higher by 4.5%. The company selling $1.5 billion worth of its stake in Mobileye, the automotive tech tech name and with options to sell further shares as well. The other top, top story is Coinbase. Shares down significantly after the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, said it's suing Coinbase for breaching securities law. Bloomberg also has fresh thoughts on this from SEC Chair Gary Gensler, weighing in on the state of the crypto industry and the steps it needs to take to protect customer assets and its integrity. Have a listen. I think the crypto industry more broadly, if it's going to have any success going forward, has to come into compliance with basic public policy about disclosure, about avoiding conflicts, about segregating, properly segregating customer funds and guarding against fraud manipulation. Without that, this whole area stands a chance of collapsing like a house of cards. The SEC sues Coinbase. Let's unpack it further with Shanali Basak, Bloomberg Wall Street reporter. Shanali, what is at the core of the SEC's argument here? A few things here we have to think about. This claim that the SEC is making, that they are acting as an unregistered broker-dealer and listing unregistered securities, which has been up for debate in the crypto community when it comes to regulators, at least, for, for a long time now. Coinbase, we know, says that a lot of the things that they've listed are not securities, while the Securities and Exchange Commission believes they are, and they have a very specific list here of tokens that they have referred to as believing as securities. When we've 
we've spoken to Brian Armstrong on, about this on the record. They have talked about the listing process they've had at Coinbase, so we know that they vigorously disagree with what the SEC is saying. Listen, Ed, I think there's another couple of twists and turns in the story, too, because if you remember, Coinbase actually had uh, looked to acquire or had acquired a broker-dealer license that has been dormant with the SEC. So I expect that to come back up again because they have been talking about that in recent months. So it's not for lack of trying to become a broker-dealer as they are being sued by the SEC here. Let's just broaden the conversation to Binance, which yeah. of course was the news of yesterday. So the SEC is tackling all manners of exchanges at the moment. Yeah, and you have two different things happening on two different days. You have Binance, the largest exchange in the world, but some of the allegations being made against Binance are very different than the ones being made against Coinbase here. At Binance, they are looking at know your customer rules, corrupted trading volumes, reliance on related party transactions. Another thing to look at with Binance is the difference in where the suit was filed. That is a very subtle difference. However, in the legal community here too, if you look, the SEC had filed that suit in Washington versus New York State. Remember, there are ongoing investigations elsewhere when you look at the U.S. government and how it's trying to look at Binance's operations, particularly because Binance as a whole is not on U.S. ground. When it comes to Coinbase, again, this is a matter more largely of not just unlisted securities or the allegations of having unlisted securities. It is also the staking as a service, which, as we know, is a pretty critical uh, on-ramp in the way we think about how people will engage in crypto moving forward. The other interesting thing is Coinbase is based in the United States, publicly listed. The SEC allowed that to happen. And so there are, there are different tensions going on here, and the way that they are, in fact, litigated will also be different. My sources are saying over Coinbase, not surprisingly, that they intend to defend themselves very vigorously as what you would expect from a suit here that is not settled uh, as, as, it, as it stands today. All right, our thanks to Bloomberg Shanali Basak, Wall Street report out there in New York. Meanwhile, venture capital giant Sequoia Capital is splitting global operations into three separate firms as geopolitical tensions between the U.S. and China continue to simmer. Let's get more details with Lizette Chapman covering all things venture capital for Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with Sequoia specifically. I, I kind of feel like the writing's been on the wall for this firm or three separate entities for some time. Yeah, I think that's that's right. Um, this has been a rough, it just kind of going back here, Sequoia has um, had a very tough year. They've had a lot of, lot of challenges from um, you know, challenges related to um, the change structure right before the public markets tanked, to their backing of Twitter, to their their backing of uh, FDX, FTX, the largest crypto uh, implosion that you guys have been talking about on the show on and off and on and off. And so they've had a lot of issues this past year, increased tensions from Washington, D.C. to really clamp down on what they're doing in China, what they have been doing um, there in terms of uh, supporting investments there, both directly from their U.S. partners and through their limited partners, through who they um, convinced to invest in its Sequoia China yeah. operations two decades ago, um, have all come together to this moment. So it's been building for a while. But then the ripple effects, Lizette, go to Lightspeed China partners, as well as DST Global. Do we expect that others will have to make similar moves? Is this a very individual, idiosyncratic event? There has been mounting pressure, I'd say, for the past year or so. It's really intensified in the past few months um, on the part of Washington lawmakers to crack down on investors um, here in the U.S. that are backing Chinese startups that are focused on sensitive technologies, AI, quantum, autonomous drones, and other areas that could have a military application and, in fact, do. Um, in many cases, you look at DGI drone. Now, to your question, is this just the ripple effect? Is this the beginning of more to come? Again, we don't have, that's a great question. We don't, haven't heard anything from Lightspeed and Co2 and some of the other US-based investors who've also made big bets there. But there is um, uh, activity um, on the Hill. There is an EO, an executive order, which is expected. Um, right. And it has been expected for some time and has not yet come through. So what that EO is going to look like and whether it's the first step of many or the final will we'll help answer that question, Caroline. Yeah, the, the policy landscape perspective is that Bloomberg has reported the president is considering 
limiting outbound investment to China. When you and I, Lizette, are out in the valley at events, whatever, speaking to venture capitalists, there's also this ethical and philosophical consideration, either about taking money from Chinese LPs or deploying capital into Chinese startups. Just tell us what you're hearing on that front. Well, one of the biggest, um, that's, a, that's a great point. One of the biggest things that you and I have both been hearing has been this bickering kind of between um, you know, VCs that are really investing and focusing on defense technology and national security applications that seem to be the loudest voices in the room. These are ones including um, Founders Fund and um, Andreessen Horowitz um, through their American Dynamism Fund that are looking at U.S. Um, competition um, in these emerging technologies and the applications that it could have for for military. Now, you know, in terms of what this what this means and kind of that tension between those firms, um, we haven't heard anything yet from from any partners as to you know whether this this split up is is enough or not. But there is concern about about the support that U.S. money is giving a lot of firms. I think it's worth noting that it's. Um, that, that one thing that, that Sequoia did not mention in this is what's going to happen to their U.S. partners that still have an interest mm. in the funds that have already made, they've made these investments years and years ago. I mean, I'm thinking about TikTok. I'm yeah. thinking about DJI um, and, and other ones where they have billions and billions of dollars, but it's illiquid. And they made these investments at a time that it was legal. So now we're looking at a situation where um, they they have this money, but they can't necessarily get it out right now. And that's not even the focus of their announcement today. But that's kind of the elephant in the room to some extent. And they said, you know, hey, it's not geopolitical tensions that are pushing us. That They kind of downplayed that in some statements. But, um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of tough to um, avoid that when, yeah. when any, you know, I, I, I don't really know that that is um, going to be their final statement on it. Is that Chapman? We'll see. I'm sure there'll be plenty more reporting coming from you on all of this. We thank you so much for breaking it down. Meanwhile, coming up, of course, well, we've got to discuss Apple's push into spatial computing. What does that mean? And a consumer's going to buy it at a $3,500 price tag? We'll see. Watching shares of Apple at the moment as we head to break, of course. Currently a bit muted. They've been bouncing around on the day. On an intraday basis, we're off by half a percentage point. So maybe we bought the news, sold the fact. This is Bloomberg. So in the same way that Mac introduced us to personal computing and iPhone introduced us to mobile computing, Apple Vision Pro will introduce us to spatial computing. This marks the beginning of a journey that will bring a new dimension to powerful personal technology. Tim Cook there. One day on after the Worldwide Developers Conference unveiling the Apple Vision Pro and the era of spatial computing. For more, let's bring in Judy Ask, Principal Analyst at Forrester, who has jetted in on the red eye, having been at that event. So 10 out of 10 for all the effort to be made to describe to us what on earth spatial computing is. Thank you. Yeah, no, I uh, had the opportunity to put on the, it's not a headset, it's a spatial computing device <laughs> and get a private demo. And I would tell you, it impresses. It is, it's like nothing I've ever tried before. And I've tried on a lot of headsets Yeah. from the, uh, the setup is easy, the interface is very intuitive than for most devices, and then when you think about almost 180 degrees field of view, it's, you can't imagine it. So at three and a half thousand dollars, do you feel that that's the right price tag? They're going for, you know, a luxury item before they go for complete compute power in everyone's hands? Yeah, so I think that often that is the Apple strategy, and I think one of the other advantages of not calling it a headset is an uh, Apple computer costs anywhere from about eight or $900 up to 7,000. So this is a mid-range <laughs> computing device, spatial computing device for Apple. It's not an expensive headset. Julie, I'm sorry, I've got to go back to this. The one question that everyone has, I was at Apple WWDC as well. What is spatial computing? Yeah, it's 3D. So I'll get, let me give you a few examples of what that means. So in one example, I was what appeared to be on the top of a cliff above a fjord in Norway, and I was able to peer over. 
I was also able to sit at the edge of a lake and listen to the lapping water on the shore while reading a book. I was, uh, a butterfly came at one point and landed on my finger and a dinosaur gobbled my hand. So those are a few examples. But the other exciting thing about this new device is that it can take photos and it can take videos. So I watched children uh, having a birthday party and to allow consumers to create those kind of videos on their own, we haven't seen something like this in a very long time. What, what jumped out at me when I got up close and personal with the Vision Pro was, was the appendage, the battery pack. Mm -hmm. and the gray cable running from it. What did you make of that? Well, it's, so a couple things. So one, you know, the concern with a device like this that we're not calling a headset is always the weight of the device. So everyone's looking for ways to take any kind of weight or size out of it. So as it is now, the device is about one pound, and so that's on the head. And then the battery pack is about the size, maybe of an iPhone or an iPhone Pro, and it sits to the side. Uh, the battery life is two hours, I believe. And I've heard some folks knock that, but on the other hand, you're un also unlikely to have this device on your head for more than you know, one to two hours. And so I, I think they've engineered that just about right, that it's, uh, the battery pack's gonna last longer than I'm likely to have this on my head for one session. You know, at Caro, being at Apple Park, paying close attention to the, the keynote, the presentation, there was a lot of emphasis on, on the, the idea that the Vision Pro can do lots of things that are accessible on the iPad and iOS, that, that all that great stuff, it's ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, and given the price point, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I think it's a very smart strategy because if you look at the VR headset market today, it's primarily gaming, it's education, it is a little bit of fitness, and then uh, Meta is hopeful for some social media. If you look at the strategy that Apple is taking with their device, it's tapping into media consumption, which is e far, far easier for consumers to get up and get running and get going and have enjoyment from the device. And it also taps into the Apple One services that so many of their customers are already buying. If you think about it, typical Apple smartphone owner, more than 90% of them also own an Apple computer, more than half of them own a tablet, a third of them own an Apple Watch or a, one of the smart speakers. And so Apple, I don't know if you want to call them enthusiasts, people who own Apple products tend to own the many products within the ecosystem. Yeah. And so when they use something like the Apple One services, they get the benefit of using those devices, you know, that service across all of the devices they own. So very easy, quick startup and very easy, fast utility yeah. and value to the consumers what this device will deliver. Judy Ask, Jet Setting from Forrester Research, we thank her so much. We'll have more on this later, of course. We've got AI aficionado CEO, Magic Leap, Peggy Johnson, Ed. And also coming up, startup Instabase makes use of open AI large language models and nabs a $2 billion valuation in the process. More on that next with the CEO, Annette Budwaj. This is Bloomberg. Business services startup Instabase has raised a new round of funding, doubling its valuation to $2 billion, a deal buoyed by the company's use of new generative AI tools in its suite of corporate products. Let's bring in the CEO, Anant Badwaj, for more. Welcome to the program. Great to be here. Basically, you're building on GPT-4. We use GPT-3.5 and GPT-4 and four both uh, as part of our product moving forward, yes. What was the attractiveness of using that foundation model when you yeah. were thinking about your future use case and functionality? Yeah. So earlier we used smaller language models, and one of the requirements in that case is if you want to make it work for like diverse set of problems, you have to fine-tune those models or basically retrain it on customer data. Like You have to take a few more samples. This one can work out of the box. So for example, I can just take the same model and apply it for legal discovery use case, or for loan processing, or for writing poetry. So you don't need to kind of like retrain or fine-tune it for every single use case, which is a very, very, very valuable stuff for our customers because now they can use it from day zero. Overall, the focus that you've made on productivity and the idea that this is going to sort of revolutionize, this is what the market seems to be gripping onto, the fact that AI is going to add, inject trillions of dollars of productivity into the overall economy. Do you buy into that, Anant? Do you think that the efficiency is right here, right now, and you're able to sell this sort of product easily into your product, into your overall client base? Yes, I do believe so. And I think I'll give you an example along the spectrum of like 
from individuals to small businesses to large enterprises. Like currently AI has reached to the point where like for people like us as an individual, if we want to file taxes, we can give all the documents and it can generate the tax filing for us, saving like a lot of time. And you can find like hundreds of huge cases of similar kind. Now let's take an example of like small business. Let's say you are a legal firm and you have to do like you provide immigration, you know, sort of like form filling or immigration services. Now you can collect all the data from your customers and AI can read all of those stuff and generate automatically the form filling, saving a ton of time. And we already work with like large enterprises. In yeah. fact, you know, four of the top banks are our customers in the US. Globally, we have several customers like Standard Charter, NatWest, AXA, and so on. And mortgage processing or know your customer or client onboarding, yeah. we have been able to automate all those and we are seeing that AI can significantly increase productivity both at individual level as well as at operational level. I can tell that being able to reel out all these current customers, the adoption rate, that's going to be easier to raise funds in that sort of an environment. But this is a difficult environment to raise funds. How quickly could you raise them? Was it the amount that you wanted? And, and ultimately, what do you put the money to work for, Anand? So, yeah, this environment is definitely slightly more difficult than, you know, prior environments that we have been uh, in all the prior environments. You know, in, we never had to go out to the market to raise. In fact, somebody came and offered us the money. Uh, in this case, uh, I mean, we talked to a few investors. It took us about three to five months of total yes. time to raise, to raise the round. Uh, but it wasn't super complicated, mainly because most of the investors who participated were already are existing investors, which helped us significantly. The yeah, Arjun Seti of Tribe Capital been on this program, takes a board observer seat with you. What is it like doing business with OpenAI? I know Brad Lightcap helped you technologically, but what is the financial relationship between you? Is it good value using their underlying model? So it's definitely a good value for us in the sense that we can help our customers get value very, very quickly. From the perspective of open AI relationship, given that we work with very regulated environments like banks, we had to get into special partnerships like how, what happens with data retention policy, what is privacy, what is security, how we can run the models in a way where it is compliant with yes. the requirements that we have. So that's why we had to develop a deep relationship with open AI to make sure that we can run it that way. 15 seconds. Dreams of going public? Yes. Oh, okay. One word answer, Caroline. Dreams of going public. He got the memo, Instabase CEO. And uh, great speaking with you. Thank you. And Ant Badwaj there. Meanwhile, so much more ahead when it comes to the focus on AI and indeed to the venture capital community. We've got VC Spotlight coming up in a moment. From New York, from San Francisco, this is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow out here in San Francisco. Caroline, let's get a quick check in on the markets and in truth, a real muted session. Uh, not much going on. S&P 500 up a tenth of a percent, basically flat on the Nasdaq 100. Some rotation into financials, some bottom feeding potentially going on. Not much of a clear catalyst as we've had in recent sessions. The yield on US 10 year, 3.7% up by a couple of basis points. Bitcoin kind of stabilizing. When those headlines came out about the SEC suing Coinbase, there was a knee-jerk reaction adding to the events of the last 24 hours and, and the SEC also looking at Binance. But we've kind of recovered a little bit, 26,000 US dollars per token or so. In terms of the individual mover, one to the downside, but given its size, its market cap, its weighting in major indices, we take a look at Apple. Kind of Trading neither here nor there, a lot of the streets saying that the announcements from WWDC, the specifics on the Vision Pro mixed reality headset, that's priced into the stock, or it's a sell the news event for a lot of the, a lot of the market, softer by about half a percentage point. But of course, coming off fresh intraday record, uh, which it had come off anyway after the events of the keynote. Carrot. 
Yeah, and it was notable at that keynote how perhaps artificial intelligence was just laced in there into the future of this product and the future of the chips, of course, that they were announcing, the strength, the capability, generative AI being one of them. We want to dig into artificial intelligence a little bit more in our VC Spotlight segment, and we want to bring in an investor who's also a founder, deeply rooted in AI. Jacqueline Rice Nelson is here, general partner in early stage venture fund coalition operators and the CEO and co-founder of Tribe AI. It's a, a network of all the world's top technologists that builds advanced AI solutions for companies of all sizes. And that coalition must be rather busy right now. I mean, how much inbound are you getting? Uh, a lot, um, which is uh, on both sides of the business, actually. So um, right now you are hearing about lots of innovation happening across uh, the tech sector and with AI companies specifically, tons of early stage development. Um, it's never been more attractive to start a company and certainly an AI company. Um, and then on the tribe side of the house, companies have never needed more help to become AI companies. Um, and so we are really helping with that sort of last mile of delivery from experimentation into really helping companies build solutions that they can put in front of the market and the product. And Look, what the market, what investors, what everyone is trying to discern is whether the hype is reality, whether all these talk of trillions of dollars being added to, market, to overall GDP and productivity mm -hmm. is actually happening. When you're building with Tribe AI inside corporate America right now, are you seeing real productivity gains? It's still early um, in, I think, the AI market period. But uh, if you even look pre-generative AI, hmm. there have been tremendous gains from machine learning. You really only need to look at Google, Amazon, Facebook, et cetera. There probably isn't a part of these businesses that isn't running with AI and machine learning. You just mentioned it yourself. Even though Apple didn't talk about AI explicitly, there, it was embedded into everything they announced yesterday. Um, and this is really the nature of how all businesses will be built going forward. Um, and it is just the beginning of truly experimenting for many of these much larger organizations, true incumbent enterprise players, who are building with AI uh, truly as experiments. Uh, the pace at which they are moving to adopt these technologies is frankly unlike anything I've ever seen before. Um, but I think the gains from them are still uh, sort of in that experimental phase. And this is very much where my thesis is on the market, is that we are still so early um, and the opportunity for enterprises to become AI companies is going to create massive value creation across the economy. Well, Jacqueline, with your venture capital hat on, how do you play the market in real terms? Twelve and a half million dollars doesn't seem like a lot of dry powder, even at the seed or early stage. You know, we just had Instabase on two billion dollar valuation for a company built on GPT 3.5, but it's basically an enterprise company. So how do you actually have a meaningful impact and establish a portfolio of companies that will give you a realistic chance of exit down the road? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this is what's on everyone's mind right now. So when I look at the early stage market, I'm really looking at pre-seed through Series A. Um, and uh, these opportunities are still quite nascent. Some of them are priced at crazy levels, um, and others are, are still quite attractive from a pricing perspective. Um, so there's really a range, and I think we are getting in on the ground floor. What I get really excited about is companies that are actually using AI to solve real problems. And so I, I really do think of this as sort of the new vertical SaaS. Um, so uh, AI will be used to solve problems for particular types of verticals, businesses, buyers, um, and that is where I think we're going to see the most gains from a valuation and tech perspective long term is when AI is not just used as a buzzword um, or as something to get the highest pricing or valuation they possibly can, but actually to solve a real need for customers and for uh, target buyers that otherwise uh, is being completely unserved. Jacqueline, is there a specific use case or area that you think generative AI or foundation models will unlock? Tell me, you know, what is it that gets you excited that's maybe underappreciated in the market? Yeah, there is really so much that gets me excited. I think where all of the focus today is, is on just how fast 
things like ChatGPT have been adopted, um, but this has happened before. So if you look at consumer adoption of Netflix, Instagram, uh, TikTok, uh, consumers have actually moved through these platform shifts at really fast paces. Now AI is moving faster th for consumers, but what's most interesting to me is actually the pace at which businesses are moving. And that frankly is what is so different about this and feels like a true, true platform shift. Um, and when I look at past platform shifts, so think data migration and cloud, um, even the SaaS wave, these, if these were waves, AI is the tsunami, uh, and the tsunami, the large wave is coming, um, and I think this is where I see the tremendous opportunity, both for Tribe but from an investment perspective, is to help some of these larger companies, enterprises and B2B companies, actually adopt this technology into their business and leverage it for the full capabilities of their data. And that takes talent. What's so interesting about Tribe, Tribe AI, member-only network, the people, the experts that you have on there, how are they sort of selling themselves? Are you seeing that, are they consulting? Are they being remunerated for this? Are they wanting to take full-time roles? Is the market just exploding for one type of talent in tech right now? Uh, yes, <laughs> it is. Uh, I think when people think about AI, they really think about just one particular skill set in this market. They think about the traditional classic AI engineers, the types of people who can build these foundation models. Uh, what's most interesting to me is, is one, I don't think that talent set is actually as scarce as other people do. Um, so we have managed to actually amass hundreds of truly the top tier talent in this industry. Um, and uh, they want, they, they're like any top employees, uh, many companies listening in, CEOs are going to feel uh, they have similar conversations with their employees, but the things that impact them aren't any longer sort of kombucha or ping pong. Mm. It's, <laughs> it's actually really making an impact. Um, and so looking for opportunities where they can really learn, where they can earn uh, and, and be remunerated for their skills, but actually make a real impact and use their skills to advance uh, the field of AI and really make a difference in companies is, is what we're really seeing talent cares about. How diverse is that talent? Because there's a lot of focus that there's bias in AI. The AI is probably going to disrupt jobs mainly held yep. by women. How diverse um, people of color women are there in your talent pool? So in our talent pool, we take diversity very seriously. And this is, of course, I'm a, a woman founder who has built uh, her career uh, in part focused on diversity. Um, it's something I deeply care about. Uh, and when you look at tech more broadly, diversity has been a challenge. When you look at AI and specialty engineering areas, it's even more challenging. Okay. And so uh, what I, A, we, we make a very concerted effort to make sure we're recruiting a diverse talent pool and staffing a diverse talent pool across projects and companies. Um, and then beyond that, I think what I spend a lot of time thinking about is incentives. So uh, ethical AI and building AI that reduces bias is going to be critical no matter how diverse the network is because we all are humans and fallible. And so how can we actually build incentives into um, uh, really all aspects of development in this field such that people are actually building responsibly and building systems and programs that will make humanity better, not just make companies right. more efficient. Coalition operators, partner and Tribe AI CEO and co-founder Jacqueline Rice Nelson. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now still ahead, first day in the books. It's Linda Yaccarino's first day as Twitter CEO. More on what's in store for her after the break. This is Bloomberg. Time now for Talking Tech. The Japanese government is planning to triple domestically produced chips by 2030 with a focus on economic security measures and advanced technology like generative AI. 
And TSMC just tempered its outlook for 2023 capital spending as the main chip maker to Apple grapples with soft demand for smartphones in particular, but also computing chips. TSMC reaffirmed projections for revenue in the first half of 2023, which will decline by about 10% in US dollar terms. And Baidu, an ed tech company that's providing services to more than 150 million students around the world, has skipped payments on a $1.2 billion loan, escalating a conflict with lenders. The firm says it won't make any further payment to the lenders until their dispute is decided in court. Karen. Fascinating global array of stories. Let's go even more global right now, Ed, and turn to one of the most read stories on Bloomberg right now, most tweeted about, it's going viral. Shock merger between the PGA Tour and its Saudi-backed rival, Live Golf. Let's talk about that and the Middle East Kingdom's money increasingly influencing not just our world of tech, of VC, but also the world of sports. I'm pleased to say Bloomberg Scarlet Foo rushes to set all about this. And, okay... This seems like quite a sudden change of t tune coming from the player. Completely, because they were just locked into this vitriol and uh, a lot of charges flying back and forth, lawsuits between the two. They're pretty entrenched in their two sides. The PGA Tour uh, arguing that Live Golf was coming in and stealing away players with lots of money, which of course it was doing, and Live Golf saying that the PGA Tour was acting, acting monopolistically by banning uh, anyone who participated in Live Golf tournaments from playing in the PGA Tour. So they were suing each other. It looked like a, this, this break in the sport, a civil war in the sport. And then all of a sudden you get a surprise merger with the two sides saying, you know what, all the lawsuits will now end and the governor of Saudi Arabia's sovereign wealth fund, which of course backs the Live Golf Tour, will be the new chairman of this as yet unnamed company and the PGA huh. Tour will appoint the majority of the ward. So if we're going in with sporting analogies, has someone won here and is it Live? I'm not sure. It's not clear, but it would seem that the PGA has kind of conceded here because it was really staking this claim uh, saying that th this, what Liv was doing was trying to buy players. They were the home of the traditional golf PGA Tour was, and Liv was coming in as an upstart. So certainly by the looks of it, with Saudi money now infusing the PGA Tour or this new company, you could make that argument. On the other hand, um, Liv didn't really have any broadcast ability for its tournament. Yes, they signed a deal with CW Networks, but that was in the U.S. Beyond that, they were streaming on YouTube mm -hmm. and also on their own website. So it's not like they were getting a lot of viewers, and they certainly weren't attracting sponsors either. I mean, there are quite a lot of viewers on YouTube, maybe. I, I, <laughs> we're talking tech, of course. But, Ed, I mean, this does feel like something that we talk about day in, day out, of just the power and the deep pockets particularly Saudi Arabia, Arabia, of Middle East in right. general. And, and ultimately, that brings power, that brings board membership, that brings a voice. It brings a voice. It's a debate that's been raging. I bet you Scarlet Fu watched Full Swing on Netflix. I watched yes. it. And they, they, you know, they documented this whole saga. But do you, know, do you know what's crazy? How many golf fans there are right now? You go on Google Trends, yeah, Scarlet. Yeah. Immediate spike in searches on this topic, real-time data. <laughs> Because, because, like, how many people really play golf and are searching for it on Google Trends? But also it's the most trending thing on Twitter in the U.S. It is surprising because before the pandemic, it felt like golf was going into this decline where everyone was saying this is a stodgy old sport. They really need to find ways to reach a younger audience, younger viewers, younger players. And then the pandemic came along and then you have this naturally socially distanced sport. Everyone wanted to get outside and it it was a revival in the sport of golf. And as you mentioned, Ed, uh, Full Swing, the Netflix documentary on golf, it just worked out yes. timing-wise that it happened right along the Live Golf uh, dispute. And so you had players talking about it, deliberating over it. There were press conferences where people didn't want to answer questions on it. So timing-wise, it all worked out for the sport of golf. Yes. Uh, for the PGA Tour, certainly it felt like it was being encroached upon by Live Golf. And... I guess now, in retrospect, it seems inevitable that something had to happen between these two sides. But at the time, they were really dug in. It didn't seem like there was any daylight. There, there was any way that the two could, could come together. I, I actually asked Netflix for some viewership figures around Full Swing. I was curious uh, how many people actually watched it, and they haven't replied yet. Well, we'll bring you that data. 
Uh, Scarlett, I guess it all comes down to money. Yes. You always. know, there's been some interviews this morning. They've put out statements. What do we know about the investment and what's at stake here? Well, we don't know how much Saudi Arabia is going to put into this new as yet unnamed company, but they will have a stake. It will be a minority stake. But we do know that uh, reportedly the Sovereign Wealth Fund, uh, Public Investment Fund, reportedly made a $2 billion investment in Live Golf. They back, of course, the, the golf league as well. So if more money was needed, they would certainly plow that into it. Uh, my understanding is that Live Golf did not make a whole lot of money in its first year, about $75 million at most in revenue last year. And again, that goes back to the lack of big sponsors because most of the sponsors were committed to the PGA Tour. Now that changes, right. of course, uh, with the two sides deciding to come together. There's still a lot of question marks, though, about all these legal battles because even though the two sides have decided to end their, their lawsuits against each other, the Department of Justice uh, got embroiled into this as well. They're investigating the PGA Tour for monopolistic antitrust behavior, and maybe they'll come in and say, you know what, the two sides, you can't merge. We don't know. And, and in that instance, it was, a, was because the PGA Tour said to the players, you can't go. You know, it, yeah. it's just an amazing yeah, dynamic. You, know, you can't come back to us. Right. Uh, and who would have thought on, the, on across 18 holes that would be an issue? <laughs> Bloomberg Scarlet Foo, thank you very much. Now, still ahead, first day in the books, Linda Yaccarino's first day as Twitter CEO. More on what's in store for her after the break. This is Bloomberg. First day is already in the books for Linda Yaccarino. It's day two now for Twitter's new CEO, taking the helm after a pretty rocky tenure from Elon Musk, of course. Look, let's just dive a little bit deeper into what lies ahead for Linda Yaccarino and Twitter at large. Bloomberg Sarah Fryer, I'm very pleased to say, joins us. And you know, optimism abound when you look at her tweets, but ultimately she's got a big sort of area to stabilize, particularly when we've seen some important executives lead, particularly in the trust and safety part. I mean, that's an understatement. She has a huge task ahead of her. She has all the advertisers to win back over. Um, the New York Times reported on, on Monday that Twitter's ad revenue is down 59% from the year earlier based on internal documents. That is her job, is to restore that and, and grow it past, um, you know, what it was before and other business, other business lines, like, like maybe Twitter subscription business, it's Twitter Blue. And she has to do all that without um, these key executives who were in charge of keeping the site uh, hospitable to advertisers by removing violent content, pornography, um, hate speech, things that people wouldn't want, brands wouldn't want to have their content next to. And frankly, users don't want to, to post their tweets next to either. So it's, it's really going to be an uphill climb for Yakarina. She seems quite enthusiastic in her public tweets, but of course she has to be. She's just getting started. <laughs> You know, what's interesting to me, Sarah, is her use of Twitter. So she's welcomed some new hires from NBC Universal via Twitter. Uh, she did that, I think, Sunday before even day one. You know, you know this landscape. You know the executives that operate within social media. What do you make of her use? It's kind of almost muskian in a way. Well, she has to. I mean, she has to use the product to show how it can. She has to set an example for instance, um, with the others who were her peers. I mean, she's going to be selling Twitter ad space to the people that she sold NBC ad space to. And one of the things um, that she would say when she was at NBC Universal is, this is, this is cleaner than social media. This is you, what you see is what you get. Like these shows are, are appropriate for your brand. And now she's going to have to take a very different tact and, and say, you know, social media is, is a place where anyone can talk. And yeah, it's going to be a little bit different, um, uh, especially under Elon Musk, as he's rolled back those content rules, as he has fewer staff that can actually implement um, some brand safety measures on the site. She's going to have to sell that. And, and Camp Con is coming up and, and all sorts of mm. opportunities for advertisers to spend on Twitter. Yes. And we'll have to see if they, if they restore their budgets. 
Uh, she has tweeted, Bay Area views coming soon, so maybe she's moving out here towards FS. Our thanks to Bloomberg Tech Editor Sarah Fryer. Wow, two days in, what a week so far. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology, Carrot. Yeah, you do not want to forget our podcast, of course. You can find it on the terminal as well as online on Apple, Spotify, iHeart, wherever you choose to digest. And yeah, if you go to some of those, well, history in the making, they call it, on those tweets. More on that soon to come. This is Bloomberg. Thank you.